Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah Wolf. I'm the director of the MA in International Relations at Queen Mary um, in Paris. Um, and we host uh, this uh, lecture panel uh, lecture. It's the last of a long series of Next UK Jean Monnet um, Center of Excellence event. It's a project that is on the future of EU UK relations. Um, and we've been running the project for three years now, but uh, we, we're quite happy to be able to hold this event in person. I think we had three or four events in person <laughs> over three years. So welcome everyone. Uh, tonight we will talk about Europe and the French presidential elections. Uh, I'm sure you have all followed um, the results uh, yesterday uh, evening um, about the two runners uh, of this uh, election. But we have a very um, prestigious uh, or panel of prestigious speakers uh, tonight who hopefully will also help us to understand a little bit uh, what happened, what are the challenges uh, for Europe, also how uh, European uh, partners have been looking at these elections. Um, I think just a very short introduction is, is I think, one of the main, um, let's say, uh, uh, lessons that we see is that the traditional left-right cleavage uh, has, uh, I'm not sure if it has completely exploded, but at least we see clearly a cleavage between those who are uh, pro-European and let's say open and a more nationalist uh, or let's say more um, anti-European Union, at least from, from our perspective as the Center for European Research. So uh, we'd like also to hear a little bit uh, um, on, on this analysis. Uh, and some have already announced that traditional left and right uh, parties in France um, are dead. Um, so we will have this discussion uh, tonight. Um, and um, we have uh, our first speaker will be uh, Emmanuel Rivière. He's the uh, director general uh, of the uh, opinion poll Institute Pantar Public. Um, and uh, you will offer us an overview of uh, the sociology and, and, and the results uh, of this uh, election. Um, and uh, you have been also, uh, or you will preside also uh, the Kenta Center on the Future of Europe. Uh, so that's also in this context that we have invited you and you also teach at Sciences Po uh, in the communication and the communication master in uh, politic, uh, in, in political communication uh, of Paris. Uh, um, we then welcome uh, Professor Sylvie Strudel uh, from uh, University Paris Panthéon Assas. Um, and uh, you will um, um, give us uh, an overview also, I think, a more um, in depth political science and sociological, political sociology uh, overview of the result. You are a member also of the. Uh, I would say, editorial committee of the Revue Française de Sciences Politique. Um, and uh, you teach uh, political sociology, but also um, uh, political sociology of Europe, which is also uh, very interesting to us. Um, and then uh, we also uh, welcome tonight uh, Yves uh, Surel. <laughs> Uh, who's also from the same university, Paris Panthéon uh, Assas. Um, and uh, you are currently um, in the public law and political science department there, um, doing research and you have done extensive research on public policy, comparative politics, um, and you also teach uh, at uh, Sciences Po Paris. Um, and I think uh, you have been uh, involved in um, running the uh, public politics groups, group of the Association Française de Sciences Politiques as well. Uh, finally, my dear colleague Rainbow Murray has arrived. Um, and uh, she's from Queen Mary University of London. Um, and uh, she's also involved uh, in, and she has extensive experience in uh, French uh, politics. Uh, I think uh, your, um, it's the, um, now I have a, I can't remember if it's the ECPR, French group, French politics group, uh, uh, that you're co-chairing, PSA. So the Political Studies Association. 
Um, but she's also, uh, I mean, she had major publications and she's also um, able and she has expertise on um, the role of women also in French politics and has worked also on uh, quotas uh, and uh, the reform also of uh, um, the electoral law as well in France. Uh, so, and we will welcome also Nicolas Sauger, who will join us a little bit uh, later. Uh, I will introduce him when uh, he arrives. Uh, I think uh, we will get uh, started by Emmanuel Rivière, and uh, I think uh, if you could provide us with an overview of the results and your analysis uh, from uh, Quentin's uh, perspective. Uh, would be a pleasure. Um, good evening. Um, as you said, it's very nice to have uh, live events and to meet people uh, in person. A real pleasure after all those webinars uh, on, on the same kind of topic. Uh, it's quite interesting to look at yesterday's results with a uh, European perspective because it makes the analysis um, even more, I can't say exciting, maybe inspiring, because it makes a contrast uh, between what could be expected uh, in regard with the uh, uh, economical um, and global context of France in Europe and the results more uh, uh, impressive. What I mean by that is that uh, in our, the research that the public has collected to uh, monitor the attitude of uh, French people compared to other countries uh, towards the European Union, we have, we have made a statement, statement that the European Union has improved its reputation, its image during the last two years, uh, particularly in relation with the, uh, the, the COVID crisis in several aspects. Uh, not only has the European Union and the European Union institution uh, become more visible, but more concrete in some decision taken. Uh, some indicators that we do follow in the research system uh, named Eurobarometer that you probably know conducted on behalf of the European, Union, uh, the European Commission or the European Parliament. Uh, there are some key indicators such as trust in the European Union that has improved in Europe, in the 27 countries I've read, but also in France, from coming from a very, very low uh, starting point. I, I, uh, must admit. Uh, but also uh, the feeling that uh, Europe is uh, uh, efficient has improved in France by 10 points. In that context, if you add to that the context of the war in Ukraine, where uh, our research shows that uh, public opinion in France included were very supportive to the first reaction, the sections that I did towards the Russia, uh, the financing of the sending of weapons uh, uh, to, to the Ukrainian army. You could have expected that the political landscape uh, in France, revealed by the first round of this election, could have reflected this uh, leaning uh, toward a more pro-European uh, feeling compared to uh, 2017. We were in the wake of the Brexit vote. We were in the wake of the election of uh, uh, Donald Trump in, in the US. And in the context where the populism were rising uh, in, uh, in the EU, it, it concretized by the uh, victory of uh, Cinque Stelle and Lega in Italy one year later. And at the time, France uh, like a, a, a good surprise compared to the uh, bad scenario that were expected. We are now five years uh, after with uh, uh, a context with where the European Union has gained trust in between. And by the way, Emmanuel Macron also restored his image uh, compared to the period of the yellow jacket protest where uh, it's, his image has declined. We had at the time in, in our political monthly barometer only 21% of French citizens uh, telling that they did trust uh, Emmanuel Macron as a president. Our last uh, poll uh, in early April um, showed the support uh, at about 40%, 43% exactly, uh, very, very limited decline compared to early March. Uh, 
the immediate reaction of the war in Ukraine was a very strong rally on the flag effect. So Emmanuel Macron is high in popularity. He has claimed being, again, a very pro-European candidate. And he appeared to be, because we, I think, we will share and compare and confront for analysis and uh, uh, yesterday's results, but he seems to be in a, a weaker position compared to uh, five years ago, and with, in the perspective of the second round, because his reserves, the people, the voters that would go to for, vote for him in the second round, are quite uncertain compared to five years ago. Um, Another way of having a European perspective of yesterday's results is to compare which are the big parties in the European Parliament, or in Germany, or now again in, uh, in Italy, uh, in Spain, etc., etc., uh, the uh, SND and the EPP, and how they stand uh, and how the candidates running for those parties. Valérie Pécresse for La Repubblica, EPP, and uh, uh, Anne Hidalgo for Parti Socialist uh, SND. Uh, they did totalize, both of them, about 6%. And this is, of course, uh, a very um, uh, contrasting situation with what would be expected for uh, important, at least in terms of population, economy, country in uh, the European Union. Maybe to, to um, uh, about and, uh, and discuss that, I think it's very important to be conscious how much uh, the political landscape, from my perspective, is unstable. And the analysis of yesterday's results has to take that into account. Just think that the two uh, candidates that did, uh, were qualified for the second round, Marine Le Pen, Emmanuel Macron, are representatives of the two parties that less than one year ago we called being the big loser of the local election, the regional election and the departmental election, uh, with uh, no success in winning the region for uh, uh, Marine Le Pen and Rassemblement National and a difficulty to have a real and significant share of voice for uh, the list led by La République En Marche and in many regions, the list belonging to the majority were eliminated, by, they didn't reach the uh, 10 points uh, threshold from the, the first one. If you just compare, of course, there was something very specific to these two elections, uh, very, very low turnout with uh, two thirds of the uh, uh, French citizens who decided not to take part to the vote. But I think it gives an idea, from my perspective, of the huge instability of the, the, the political landscape. And the second aspect that um, is, from, from my perspective, uh, uh, paramount to understand yesterday's results, uh, and in, in particular, if we want to put those results uh, in a European perspective, is how much how strongly, how heavily the um, French presidential election system, the way it works, is shaping uh, the, the political uh, landscape and the political balance. You, I think we wouldn't have the same results at all if we were in a parliamentary system with a representative and proportional uh, system. And in particular, what's we draw from our uh, analysis how we have monitored during six months the potential of every candidate, how much they could they get compared to how much they finally got, uh, their, um, uh, the hesitation and the steady hesitation until the very last minute between candidates. There was clearly a very, very strong weight of the question of the qualification for the second round. What's I don't know what would be the expression in English for vote util, useful votes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there is an expression for that. Maybe because it's typically tactical, tactical vote. Thank you, Rainbow. Uh, the tactical votes. It's something that did shape the decision for many voters. And 
clearly we had anticipated a scenario for the left uh, candidates. We knew, I think, from the beginning that one of them would finally take it all because it would have been identified uh, for some reasons. It was uncertain which one would be the winner, but it was quite certain considering how much leftist voters told us that, okay, I could vote Mélenchon, but I could also choose uh, Jadot and uh, Roussel. I did not know him, but it's quite interesting. There are some issues with Anne Hidalgo, but Anne Hidalgo voters or, or potential voters said that I, I could go to, etc. So it was very likely that finally one of them would take some uh, the maximum of his potential, I said if, because it was finally uh, Jean-Luc uh, Jean Mélenchon. And it did happen because there was this big and major stake having our camp, uh, the, or values as leftist voters, uh, they said, represented in the second one. I don't think the same happened in some ways uh, uh, for Valérie Pécresse, etc. Valérie Pécresse has a, had a potential, and she lost part of the potential. Therefore, I, my, I, I will end with, with that, and uh, be pleased to have your, your, your feedback uh, on that. But I think that uh, on this, at the same time, the presidential election is very much um, the pillar of our political system, absolutely decisive. The only one who is mobilizing voters, and by the way, let's remember that the second in rank in terms of uh, turnout during the mandate of Emmanuel Macron has been the European election. Uh, the only one operating mobilizing more than 50%. Uh, it was very close with the uh, parliamentary election in 2017, but Still, there is a huge gap between the turnout in every other election and in uh, the presidential election, <coughs> and how much it is shaping the political system a bit artificially. And that might be the issue for Emmanuel Macron for uh, winning a second mandate, and if he wins, to run this second mandate, because it doesn't work anymore the way it uh, did in terms of shaping a majority. And this is part of what we did analyze with, um, when we published our report on the uh, French and the European Union uh, and uh, yeah, the ambivalent uh, attitudes towards the European Union uh, with uh, Thierry Chopin and Bruno Cotteres. One of the key issues we have identified is uh, how much the French political model, the centrality, uh, the parliamentary election being the product of the presidential election, being in strong contrast in the way the uh, majority and uh, shaping and the decision making works, works in European Parliament and in the uh, distinct institution of the European uh, Commission. And this tension, I think, has uh, widened with, uh, and we will see, of course, if Marine Le Pen is elected, which, by the way, is possible. Uh, the tension will grow uh, automatically, but I think there is something that uh, poses the question of how much uh, a president can be a, a truly European, pro-European president, and still working with this system that creates a huge gap between how politics works in, in France and how politics works at European uh, level. And I will stop with that now. And Thank you. Thank you very much. I will, I will give the floor uh, straight away to uh, Sylvie Strudel. Uh, but I just wanted to remind you also, I forgot to say that we are cooperating and we have uh, organized this event also with the GRUE, which is the uh, group uh, de recherche sur l'Union Européenne uh, that gathered actually young researchers um, from different disciplines, different countries, to work actually on the European political system. So also, thanks to them, we have this event tonight. Um, shall I put the yes, slides for you? Sorry. Just a second. So hello, everybody. And uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure for me. And uh, you're going to be very disappointed, maybe, because I'm going to speak in French. 
Why? Because I prepared my presentation in French and um, it would be a real challenge to translate it uh, now, <laughs> direct, after a long, long night, uh, as it was for all uh, specialists of electoral behavior. So I hope it would not be too, too hard for you to, that I speak in French. It's okay. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> so I'm going to try to uh, answer to the question you gave to me and the question is uh, um, did, did I notice any any change in comparison with past French presidential campaigns uh, more or less about uh, European uh, election um, European uh, issue and uh, in comparison with the, the other ones uh, 2012 2000. 17 and two, uh, 2022. Okay. Um, dans un papier que j'avais écrit avec des collègues dans la revue française de sciences politiques qui a été publié en 2013, nous avions euh, signalé que lorsque on voulait prendre en compte l'effet de l'enjeu européen sur le vote, au moment d'une élection, il fallait en fait prendre en compte et faire un choix suffisamment serré des différents éléments que l'on choisissait d'interpréter parce que sinon on risquait de mélanger un peu de manière outrancière les différents éléments à prendre en considération. Les différents éléments que nous avions mis en avant consistaient premièrement à essayer d'identifier quel était le rôle dans le contexte national et international de questions européennes, et là ça renvoie à, en fait à une question de, on pourrait dire, de visibilité dans l'espace public. La deuxième idée consistait en fait à prendre en considération la manière dont les partis et les candidats dans leur programme allaient se positionner sur un certain nombre d'enjeux européens et donc quelle place ils allaient leur faire. La troisième, le troisième élément consistait à prendre en considération cette fois-ci les positions des électeurs et de se demander quel rôle pouvait bien jouer l'enjeu européen dans leur vote. Et enfin, et enfin seulement, on pouvait se demander dans un quatrième temps si tous ces éléments-là pouvaient contribuer à euh, construire ou, ou reformater ou re, tout ce qu'on veut comme formulation, euh, en tout cas remettre en place ou mettre en place un clivage euh, basé sur euh, des questions européennes qui serait un clivage tel qu'on l'emploie actuellement, vous aviez évoqué dans la proposition d'intervention euh, la, la démarcation, euh, bien évidemment très connue, hein, l'intégration, démarcation euh, bien connue de Crisi et, et ses camarades. Euh, on peut aussi parler de la France ouverte et de la France fermée qu'a évoqué euh, Pascal Perrineau, ou bien de manière beaucoup plus générale, parler de ces éléments qui sont euh, tout ce qui tourne autour de l'Europe et qui se mesure plutôt en termes de libéralisme culturel et de conservatisme culturel. Voilà, alors, donc, une fois que ces différents éléments-là sont posés, on peut commencer à essayer de comparer les élections et de voir comment on peut trouver des éléments de réponse à ces différents points pour les mettre en avant. Alors, bien évidemment, je vais faire ça un peu à la hache pour des raisons simples. C'est la première qui est que je vais essayer de limiter, bien évidemment, mon temps d'intervention. Et donc, pour ces raisons-là, je vais être obligée d'aller un peu comme ça directement dans, dans la réflexion et la présentation. Le premier élément en ce qui concerne l'élection de 2012 euh, consistait en fait à remarquer premièrement ce qu'on avait qualifié d'un contexte d'européanisation diffuse et derrière ça on voulait en fait désigner à la fois la crise de l'euro, la question des dettes souveraines mais aussi des protestations politiques qu'on avait vu se développer dans différents pays en Europe, mais aussi en France, contre des politiques d'austérité. À cela se rajoutait un deuxième élément qui était une forme de politisation qu'on pourrait aussi, là aussi de manière un peu caricaturale, évoquer sous le terme de polarisation, qui s'était opérée entre les différents candidats, en particulier dans l'entre-deux-tours, et qui consistait à opposer d'un côté une Europe, on pourrait dire, nationalisée, à d'autre part une Europe socialisée. Et dans l'Europe nationalisée était bien évidemment plutôt du côté du, de l'UMP et l'Europe socialisée plutôt du côté du Parti socialiste. Troisième élément, du côté des électeurs, eh bien, ce qu'on avait observé, c'est qu'il y avait ce qu'on peut qualifier de bidimensionnalité des attitudes et qui, en fait, avait permis de mettre en opposition 
d'une part une grande dimension qui consistait à opposer ceux qui craignaient à ceux qui ne craignaient pas l'Europe. Et ça, c'était quelque chose qui permettait d'expliquer en particulier le vote pour Marine Le Pen. Et dans un deuxième temps, une deuxième dimension qui avait un peu moins de force, mais qui existait euh, euh, malgré tout, et qui était une dimension qui, elle, consistait à s'ordonner, euh, d'ailleurs en fonction d'une logique bien connue en France, qui est la logique euh, gauche-droite, et qui visait à opposer à gauche, qu'on pourrait appeler des craintes sociales, hein, c'est-à-dire que l'Europe menace les acquis sociaux, l'État-providence, etc. Et de l'autre côté, euh, des menaces plutôt d'ordre, on va dire, euh, national, hein, et qui renvoyaient à des thématiques de sécurité, d'immigration, de souveraineté, d'identité. Bon, ça c'est le paysage de 2012. Qu'en est-il du paysage de 2017 Alors en 2017, Là, on pourrait dire que le contexte général était plutôt celui d'une européanisation, alors je ne suis peut-être pas très sûre de mon terme, mais qu'on pourrait qualifier de polycritique. Euh, je joue un peu sur le, le sens des mots. Tout simplement poli, parce qu'il y avait plusieurs types de crises, hein, euh, dont bien évidemment la plus, la plus évidente et qui vous concerne et qui vous est familière était celle du Brexit, mais pas uniquement. Et puis euh, cr critique aussi parce qu'il euh, eh y avait des ressorts extrêmement puissants de d'euroscepticisme, hein, bien évidemment, avec des guillemets et avec un S, euh, qui permettait de, de montrer euh, des tensions par rapport à cette, euh, à cette question. Du coup, il en, il en arrivait, euh, en quelque sorte, du côté des partis politiques et du, euh, des candidats, une sorte, là encore, de, de, de structure qu'on pourrait considérer comme ternaire, qui consistait à mettre un bloc, alors il était à lui tout seul un bloc, c'était Emmanuel Macron, qui manifestait une forme de soutien inconditionnel à l'Europe dans sa dimension d'intégration européenne. Il y avait un deuxième bloc qui là était consisté euh, en un rassemblement de plusieurs candidats, et qui consistait à peut-être parler de ce qu'on pourrait euh, dire un soutien sous condition, et ce soutien sous condition était exprimé soit à gauche, ben en, particulier, euh, par, euh, euh, en particulier Benoît Hamon hein, pour le Parti Socialiste, avec ce qu'on pourrait dire euh, une prime ou un bonus qui était attendu d'un infléchissement social, et puis à droite, avec bien évidemment François Fillon, avec là plutôt un bonus, on pourrait dire, du côté de peser vers une dimension plus intergouvernementale. Et donc, on voit là euh, ce soutien sous condition qui se manifestait de deux façons, sur l'axe gauche et sur l'axe droit. Et enfin, il y avait un troisième élément, je ne peux même pas l'appeler un soutien, parce qu'il faudrait dans ce cas-là dire que c'est le type de soutien de la corde qui soutient le pendu, c'est-à-dire qu'on était là plutôt dans des stratégies d'exit, hein, euh, qui étaient incarnées à la fois à droite et à gauche, à droite, à l'extrême droite, bien évidemment par Marine Le Pen, qui était sur une position beaucoup plus dure qu'elle ne l'a été cette année, je, on va le voir, mais qui était plutôt sur des éléments... Euh, au moins verbaux, euh, de renégociation des traités avec euh, un horizon qui aurait pu être une sorte de Frexit, plus la sortie potentielle de l'euro avec remplacé, on ne savait pas très bien par quoi, soit le franc, soit les culs, enfin bon, quelque chose dans ce genre-là. Et puis, bien évidemment, à gauche, avec Jean-Luc Mélenchon qui lui réclamait une refondation totale, sociale des, euh, de la construction européenne. Et donc, du côté des électeurs, on a, il y a un certain nombre de travaux qui ont bien montré que cette élection de 2017 avait pris en compte, avait vu s'opérer un vote sur un enjeu européen qui s'était exprimé donc en faveur de Emmanuel Macron et ou en défaveur, ou en défaveur de Marine Le Pen. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'il en est en 2022, c'est-à-dire pour cette élection, pour cette élection-là alors là, je trouve en fait que les choses, je ne sais pas ce qu'en diront mes, mes collègues, je suis très très curieuse d'avoir leur avis sur ça, je trouve que les choses sont un peu plus compliquées, en tout cas dans la campagne de premier tour. Donc ce qui ne, je ne, je n'endosse pas ce que je vais dire à l'instant pour la campagne de deuxième tour, pour la raison simple qu'elle n'a pas existé et qu'on ne sait pas encore extrêmement bien comment elle va se dérouler. Moi, ce que je trouve, c'est que premièrement, il y a un contexte qu'on pourrait dire là d'européanisation massive avec les questions du Covid, la question de la guerre en Ukraine, la question de climatique, enfin vous voyez il y a toute une série de questions qui sont à l'agenda et qui sont en termes européens. Mais euh, 
à la fois l'importance de ces thèmes et l'ampleur de ces thèmes et leur nature, impose également le fait qu'on dépasse l'horizon européen, parce que c'est une des particularités aussi des crises auxquelles on a été confronté, c'est qu'on a assisté à une sorte d'extension de, de la question européenne en question internationale, parce que bien évidemment le Covid, enfin bon, etc. Bref, à partir de ce moment-là, on voit bien que la question va être un peu formulée différemment et que ce ne sera pas tellement est-ce qu'on sera en soutien à l'Europe, mais est-ce que l'Europe sera aussi un soutien à la France dans le contexte à la fois national, européen et international auquel elle va être confrontée. Alors, du côté de l'offre, euh, ce que j'ai observé, alors c'est là où je suis très mal à l'aise pour faire un commentaire parce que euh, les universitaires n'aiment pas faire des commentaires à chaud <rire> en général euh, et se replient en disant euh, on n'a pas encore toutes les données, euh, on a, enfin il nous manque des choses pour euh, dire des, des éléments étayés. Alors moi je suis particulièrement mal servie parce que je travaille sur les discours des candidats dans les meetings. Alors d'abord, bon, il faut dire que Macron ne m'a pas donné trop de travail cette année pour le moment, mais euh, ça ne préjuge pas. Je, n'injurez pas l'avenir, mais en tout cas, euh, je suis en cours, c'est un work in progress en quelque sorte, hein, de travailler sur ces données. Alors pour le moment, moi ce que je vois dans, dans ça, c'est que je constate, euh, et ça en fait, on, on, on avait posé cette question-là en 2012 déjà, ce n'est pas parce que le contexte national, européen, international est européanisé, qu'il y a nécessairement une européanisation de la campagne. C'est-à-dire que celle-ci peut très bien ne pas de sorte de ces préoccupations-là. C'est un peu ce qu'on voit quand même en ce moment. Et lorsque moi, par exemple, je cherche les occurrences d'Europe, européen, européenne, etc., dans les discours de tous les candidats sur lesquels j'ai travaillé, ben, euh, c est, c est, ils ne sont pas très nombreux. Et, euh, et ils sont encore moins nombreux que ce qu'on avait vu, par exemple, en, euh, en 2012. Et là, de ce point de vue-là, il faut regarder un peu, il faut différencier les candidats. Euh, Emmanuel Macron, je trouve, a un, a un positionnement assez ambigu euh, qui pourrait, euh, je trouve, relever à, à la fois de ce qu'on qu pourrait appeler une instrumentalisation en yo-yo. Alors pourquoi Parce qu'en en fait, il va jouer à la fois la carte de la dilatation et la carte de la rétraction. Alors, carte de la dilatation euh, qui va consister à dire... Euh, L'Europe, l'Europe, Europe, hein, en quelque sorte. Euh, C'est le cas, par exemple, en décembre, lorsque, dans une conférence de presse, euh, il va littéralement spoiler le programme euh, français euh, qui doit être présenté, de la présidence qui doit être prise euh, au 1er janvier, et où il va présenter le, un grand cadrage de ces différentes décisions, etc. Et donc, qui va amorcer, en quelque sorte, ça, sous les thématiques que vous connaissez, qui est donc euh, relance, puissance, euh, appartenance. Et puis lorsqu'on regarde son unique discours, qui a été celui qui a été fait euh, samedi dernier à la, à la, à la Défense, à l'Arena, euh, on s'aperçoit que là, l'Europe euh, est, est très présente dans son discours. Il y consacre toute la troisième partie de son discours, hein, qui est globalement euh, divisé euh, en trois parties. Alors ça, c'est pour la part, la, la dimension euh, dilatation. Mais il y a aussi une dimension rétractation. Parce que dans son discours, on aperçoit un slogan qui va revenir de manière extrêmement récurrente et qui est le slogan qui tourne autour de « pour une France indépendante ». Et donc qui est là un peu partout, disséminé dans les discours et qui pointe en fait une tentation de ce qu'on pourrait appeler une renationalisation de sa campagne. Donc, tout ça pour dire qu'on a bien le sentiment que comme en 2017, Macron va instrumentaliser cette question de l'Europe et l'utiliser comme un instrument de clivage hein, qui va lui permettre de, de, de construire un récit dans, dans sa campagne. Mais en même temps, justement, euh, il va faire un usage ambigu de l'Europe qui, d'une cer certaine façon, euh, renvoie euh, une chose que je, sur laquelle je suis en train de travailler, qui est son utilisation euh, totalement déraisonnable du syntagme « souveraineté européenne ». Et en fait, c'est très intéressant parce que... Euh, ce qui, alors, il faudrait faire des études de réception, ce qu'on ne fait pas lorsqu'on travaille sur les discours, parce que c'est extrêmement compliqué à mettre en place. Mais ce qui serait intéressant, c'est de savoir qu'est-ce que les gens entendent quand on leur parle de souveraineté européenne. C'est-à-dire, est-ce qu'ils entendent européenne ou est-ce qu'ils entendent souveraineté Et donc, bien évidemment, vous voyez, c'est pour ça que je dis qu'il y a peut-être un élément euh, ambigu dans cette, euh, dans cette façon de faire. 
Euh, L'autre élément, alors qui n'est pas ambigu, mais qui témoigne d'un infléchissement, c'est la position de Marine Le Pen, qui, depuis 2017, a, a compris un certain nombre de choses par rapport euh, au discours qu'elle tenait sur l'Europe et qui a infléchi, en quelque sorte, son récit sur... Euh, la question de la souveraineté nationale, puisque là, il est beaucoup moins question de sortir la France de l'Union ou de renoncer à l'euro. Donc tous ces éléments-là, vous le voyez, euh, montrent qu'il y a des différences hein, sur ce thème euh, à la fois présent, absent, euh, avec cette euh, formule que j'aime bien, que euh, nous devons à un de nos collègues qui s'appelle la « politics of muffling » et qui consiste très souvent euh, aussi à passer l'Europe un peu sous le tapis, lorsque, euh, en particulier, elle est destinée à montrer les, les distorsions qu'il y a dans les partis politiques, à l'intérieur des partis politiques, sur la question européenne. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'il en est du côté des électeurs Je vais juste vous montrer très rapidement des images. Hein, ça bien. Bon, juste très rapidement. Je vais utiliser un certain nombre de données qu'on a collationnées grâce à un instrument que vous connaissez. Alors, je vais vous dire la, le, le, le nom de l'instrument euh, en anglais. C'est un VAA, Voting Advice Application, euh, qu'on a mis en place avec, euh, avec trois collègues. Donc, Bruno Cotteres, euh, Thomas Vitiello et puis Vincent Martini, au CVPOF, au laboratoire... Euh, à des laboratoires de, de Sciences Po, et qui permet en fait, c'est un instrument, je ne sais pas si vous connaissez cet instrument, et si vous avez, bon, alors certains sont familiers de ça, mais donc qui permet d'identifier la position des électeurs euh, par rapport à des énoncés, des, des, pro, des morceaux de programmes qui sont ceux donc des candidats. Et à un moment donné, on regarde euh, si ça match hein, ensemble et euh, quelle est la proximité euh, entre les deux. Et donc, juste très vite, pour vous donner sur un énoncé qui est « La France tire plus d'avantages que d'inconvénients de son appartenance à l'Union européenne », vous voyez que là, ce qui est intéressant, c'est qu'on a un bloc qui est plutôt tout à fait d'accord, hein, d'ailleurs. Donc Macron, Hidalgo, euh, Jadot, euh, un peu en modéré, euh, euh, Valérie Pécresse. Et puis on a un grand bloc oppositionnel hein, qui est donc en plutôt en désaccord et tout à fait euh, en désaccord. En fait, ce qui est intéressant ici, c'est... Je vous passe tout de suite la slide qui va avec. C'est la distorsion relative qu'on observe entre les électeurs et les différents responsables des partis politiques. Alors on pourra revenir dessus, et puis je sais que Nicolas est un lecteur attentif des, des graphiques. Mais vous voyez, ce qui est intéressant, c'est que là, on a trois blocs. C'est-à-dire qu'on a un bloc autour de Macron à 61% qui dit qu'on est tout à fait d'accord avec ça. Après, vous avez un bloc... Euh, intermédiaire qui est à 50%, hein, Yannick Jadot, Anne Hidalgo et puis Valérie Pécresse, avec quand même une chose étonnante ici sur les écologistes, hein, qui ne sont euh, pas plus euh, pro-européens que ça, alors que normalement euh, ils sont bien supérieurs à ça. Et puis un troisième bloc qui tourne autour de 40%, qui est euh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, Marine Le Pen et euh, Eric Zemmour. Donc ça c'était pour vous montrer euh, cet élément-là. Et puis il y a un autre... Euh, chez moi sur lequel je vais terminer, euh, puisque vous m'avez invité pour une comparaison dans les, dans les campagnes, c'était pour vous montrer en fait des déplacements qu'il y a eu entre les différents candidats euh, sur des énoncés qui sont euh, relativement proches les uns des autres, et en tout cas euh, les, les énoncés par exemple sur l'Europe, on, euh, on les a gardés stables de 2012 à 2022, ce sont des, des énoncés qui, qui sont dans toutes euh, les enquêtes. Et donc là, vous voyez qu'il y a quelque chose qui va nous raconter une histoire de cette élection et qui est le, le déplacement. Pardon, je vais juste. Il n'y a pas de euh, C'est le déplacement. Ce qui est intéressant, vous voyez, c'est le déplacement de Macron qui perd en libéralisme culturel et qui, qui se droitise. Hein. Donc ça, ça, il y a un certain nombre de gens qui l'ont déjà bien montré, qui sont passés par là. Et puis, euh, ce qui est intéressant aussi, c'est que Annie Lago, vous voyez, elle reste à peu près sur la même ligne que. François Hollande, mais euh, elle a aussi perdu euh, en libéralisme culturel par rapport euh, à Benoît Hamon. Et puis Marine Le Pen est dans un, est dans un petit circuit, mais qui la, la, la recentre un peu, enfin je ne sais pas comment il faut le dire, mais en tout cas euh, qui la fait aller vers la droite dans sa... Euh, et c'est bien sûr sur les questions européennes que là on a observé euh, un, un petit changement. Voilà, c'est pour euh, peut-être continuer la discussion après. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Maybe I'm going to be short and to try to emphasize not the agreeing part of my speech with what you told, because basically we agree on Sorry. anything, <laughs> <laughs> but some, just some, some point um, beyond that. 
I think that, well, basically I have to speak a bit about the campaign and how uh, it differs from 2012 and uh, in 2017 and how Europe is present or not. And to some extent, you, you said it already that, well, this, the answer is quite simple. Europe is nowhere in terms of debate about institutions, but Europe is everywhere in terms of debate about policies. That's quite simple and especially, um, uh, well, it's especially clear when you compare 2022 to 2017. Basically, be, uh, between the two elections, we have lost, to some extent, some major candidates on the issue. Well, for instance, we had uh, the Frexit option in 2017, which has disappeared. It was not that important in terms of votes, but still, as you know, what there and articulated, especially in the last two weeks of the campaign, some kind of clear discourse about Europe, putting that at the core of the political agenda. In the same vein, Dupont-Aignan, this year was quite inaudible. That tells it was still there, still quite a similar discourse, but still nothing to do with which actually made the news. What I think is really striking when you compare it to election is that basically about institutions, the NATO has replaced Europe. There was no debate about whether we should have more or less Europe to some extent. Of course, we have this kind of understanding position quite clear and explicit to everyone, but no one had articulated a discourse about changing the institutions or the decision process within Europe. On the contrary, NATO, especially from Mélenchon, has been quite core in its speech, tries to emphasize not only the idea of sovereignty, but the relation to Europe on the one and to the US on the other. And of course, that is, this has been really important till Ukraine's war. And this has been a major disruption in the campaign. Because of course, with Ukraine, NATO and Russia have, been, have become, on the one hand, prominent, and the, on the other hand, difficult to articulate for this conflict against. On the other hand, nobody was really for in favor of Europe or NATO in this campaign. Of course, you quote in Macron, but Macron is speaking about Europe, as you said, just to say that France should be in, or that Europe should be France, or your France should be Europe, whatever you have the sense you want. And then, well, whether it's actually Europe or not is a bit more complicated to know, but in no case, it tells a truly European discourse of that a vision for Europe in the long term. So I think, that the major rubble that we see from this first round of campaign that tells no longer Europe was, is important compared to 2017 and you were really right in saying that Europe was really a key issue in 2017 at least in terms of cleavage and the point of articulation of disagreement. It's no longer the case in the first round. And we have replacement and we have First replacement of NATO, and the second striking point is we no longer speak about globalization. Do you remember about 2017? We were all about globalization, whether it was good, bad, whether it was bringing forward anything like Europe, that is economic growth, liberty, and this, and so on and so forth. So basically, in 2022, nobody speaks about globalization. Why? Well, for exactly the same reasons as Europe, I think. On the one hand, it's, well, the context has dramatically, dramatically changed. That is, nobody would actually push for more globalization in the campaign. Basically, everyone has been, has been more or less about economic patriotism, about how to, well, basically not even get back firms in France, but rather in the way to make France sovereign and political or international scene. And that's exactly the point. We have spoken a lot in the campaign about internationalization, but not about globalization. That is, back to, well, maybe 20 years before, when we had actual the concept of nations, we could discuss, we could fight, but no longer any kind of regional organization or even actual transnational organization that were there to actually accommodate needs and demands. That's really striking, I think. And Ukraine has, to some extent, reinforced this logic. 
Whereas, of course, NATO, well, if you're in Northern Europe, of course, you would talk about NATO, because if you were in Finland, well, of course, NATO would be really important in the discussion, but in France, it's not. And there is no actual debate, and it's only the way to protect France. And the third aspect, immigration. And that comes to, the, to, to my second point, which is basically we have not spoken about Europe and in terms of institutions, but of course, as you said it, policies and the European dimensions of policies were present everywhere. That is, immigration, of course, is an European issue. It's an European issue with a lot of discussion across countries about actual deep and important trends that we observe. It was key the campaign for 12 months with the war and everything about the war was about immigration. But at no point in time was this debate presented as an open issue. It was a kind of national issue per se, which is really striking because, of course, it's a paradox of mayor, which is what called paradox that in national elections you speak about European integration because you can't, you can't do anything about it. And in national elections, you don't speak about policy because you can't do anything about it. But now we don't speak about European integration because we can't do anything about it. And we don't really speak about policies or actual policies because we can't do anything about it, which is quite complicated in terms of dynamic of the campaign. So, and the impression that to some extent some policies have been oriented by Europe, but for most of the core European policy, no debate at all has been taken. That is, it's the point that the economists made. We didn't speak about economics in, Europe, uh, in the campaign. And economics, of course, is really linked to the European dimension. And this idea that, of course, Europe was not there, even if, if it was everywhere to some extent. So can we conclude that Europe is dead in terms of politics for France in the next two weeks, at least? Don't speak about the future, please. Um, I would tend to say yes and no because, well, I'm not from Normandy, but, but I have no precise idea about what's going to happen. But on the one hand, you can say that Europe is going to be back in the second round because basically you have exactly the same divide about Europe and a number of issues, in fact, between Macron and Le Pen. And it's quite lengthy, and, and what, it was, what was really nice in your graphs is that you show that even for Le Pen supporters, there is indeed a strong minority in favor of Europe, which is striking in terms of, well, what's going to happen, but in terms of Macron, a lot of people not, or not really satisfied with Europe as well. So do we have a chance of reorganization of these issues? I have some doubts, but yet, to some extent, what you see in the in the Republican, for instance, or on the left, you know, that all these cleavages are quite complicated by the fact that a lot of people have different types of positioning, and then the new cleavage, as we could call it, between well, radical left, radical right, and center, has not really reorganized so far. So we don't know exactly if it can happen. And then. The question is, well, do we have reasons to see another cleavage likely to emerge about the second round and the runoff? I would say it's unlikely because there is no quite clear divide between the two candidates except everything, meaning that Europe is not a cleavage, but it's just one of the points to underline and to emphasize a marginal cleavage which has been called many different names, but which oppose, well, liberal, uh, everything about liberalism, nationalism, and the view of the future. So I don't know if it's Europe or something else, but Europe is part of it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we will move to each panel. So I think we have to ask you also to compare a little bit uh, Europe in, um, in in the program of the two remaining candidates yes. and also what it meant uh, for um, other um, EU member states in the European Union. Yes, that's right. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, and thank you uh, for, I, didn't, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for their kind uh, invitation. As it happens, uh, those organizers are also former students, so this is a, a nice <laughs> achievement for a professor to 
uh, see that uh, your former students become uh, young colleagues. So uh, thank you for this invitation. So I will ask uh, two questions. The first one uh, uh, is the following, based on the results, what types of European policies can we expect from the two candidates? And the second one is the following, what could be the impact of the French elections on the European Union uh, in terms of priorities, relations with other member states and Ukraine? So I will try to stick to the comment and answer these uh, two uh, questions. Uh, and it will be based on my readings of the two platforms, uh, uh, the two uh, uh, last runners, uh, um, a reading which is not always a nice experience, okay, but uh, I will try to give some uh, elements about uh, their promises. So the first question is related to the type of European policies that uh, we can expect from the two uh, candidates. I have to say, uh, uh, to begin with, uh, my observations that uh, these observations are uh, remain dependent on the results of the legislative elections because I'm not that sure that uh, uh, even if Macron is re-elected, he will have uh, a clear parliamentary majority to implement uh, uh, his policies and his uh, promises. One, um, maybe a preliminary remark, is that the European dimension is, uh, at least in their platforms, uh, rarely uh, present. Uh, um, and this is often the case uh, when you look at uh, previous uh, presidential campaigns, since uh, uh, Europe is not always the, the matter of a lot of uh, explicit promises uh, made by the different uh, candidates. And the exceptions, as uh, some of my colleagues have already said, might be uh, 2017, when uh, Macron um, made Europe a marker of his campaign on his rise of, uh, uh, to power. So uh, Europe was also the, the basis of a lot of different promises in uh, his uh, platform, at least in 2017. So if we look at the two platforms this year, uh, the last uh, two uh, runners, uh, I think that um, they reveal, um, in the first place, uh, symbolic differences in treatment between uh, Macron and uh, Le Pen. Uh, the first one is uh, that uh, when you look at uh, Macron uh, platform, uh, there is an explicit part in this uh, document uh, which is uh, related to Europe. Uh, this is the last part. Uh, this is entitled uh, Ensuring the Power of Europe. But on the contrary, when you look at um, Le Pen's uh, platform, uh, there is no real uh, distinctive section on Europe. So Europe is uh, nowhere and everywhere uh, in a mm -hmm. platform, um, because you have a lot of different proposals uh, which are related to Europe. This is uh, scattered throughout the, the, uh, the, the program. A second difference is based on the fact that uh, um, Europe is the object of uh, explicit promises made by Macron. Uh, and on the contrary, uh, in uh, Le Pen's program, uh, um, the European Union is only impacted, let's say, by a lot of different sectoral or thematic uh, promises. So when we examine uh, the content of uh, the platform, uh, we have uh, several uh, main aspects which, which are quite uh, relevant. Uh, I will start with uh, Macron. So Macron, this is the last section of this platform. This is, uh, uh, the idea is to uh, ensure the autonomy of the European Union, to reinforce the European Union, and there are three main aspects in this uh, section. The first one is related to the energy policy, uh, because uh, one of his promises is to accelerate, accelerate decarbonization and the deployment of clean energies to uh, reduce uh, the dependence of Europe on imported coal, uh, gas, and oil. The second aspect is the technology, look, uh, technological autonomy. Uh, because uh, the promises here is to invest, to develop uh, uh, some big firms in Europe, uh, to uh, protect uh, Europe uh, in most uh, strategic areas. Uh, in, uh, in fact, uh, for example, in some uh, uh, infrastructures like uh, the cloud or uh, the satellites. And the last uh, element is based on uh, strategic autonomy. And this is uh, mainly related to defense policy. So uh, the idea is to uh, develop a common doctrine and to uh, reinforce the military capacities of uh, the European armies and their coordination. And there are a lot of uh, different uh, measures or promises uh, which are made throughout the, the program. Uh, for example, um, the uh, plan to uh, implement a carbon tax at the Europe's border. I think it is quite a bet that the yellow jackets uh, cannot be exported in uh, other European countries. And uh, it will also invent, uh, invest uh, invest, uh, uh, is uh, in uh, the development of European metaverse, so developing new technologies in this uh, in this field, and uh, he has also promised to uh, reform Schengen for better border protection. So uh, this is uh, related to uh, his uh, position on uh, uh, immigration issues. 
But what is striking is, it's often the case in platform, is that there, there are no precise elements on financial matters and no timetable uh, in, uh, uh, in, in its program. Um, to, uh, when we uh, observe the Le Pen platform, there are 22 measures uh, which uh, uh, are described by uh, or announced by Le Pen as our priorities. And there is only one explicit mention of Europe uh, in, the, in these uh, measures. This is to leave the European electricity market to find decent price, to quote uh, the exact promise. So this is uh, um, only the only explicit mention to Europe in uh, the platform. There are evidently other uh, promises which are made in uh, different uh, sectors. Maybe uh, when you look at uh, some of our discourse within the platform, uh, the main aspect is that uh, uh, she plans to uh, create a, a new uh, kind of uh, European integration. Uh, and this is called in, in our platform the European Alliance of Nations, which is uh, intended to replace the European Union. And uh, the main justification is that uh, she prefers to enhance the cooperation uh, in place of uh, federation. So uh, there is a danger to uh, have a kind of disparation of the nation state. Uh, so she prefers to create a new uh, European integration based on new institutional uh, statements. Another aspect of her uh, program is the renationalization of different policies and aids, especially for the common agricultural policy. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, to uh, um, develop uh, uh, new sovereignty in uh, economic aids, uh, uh, which are focused on uh, small and medium-sized uh, firms. And uh, one of the striking aspects in, his, uh, in our argument is that uh, she uh, also planned to uh, inverse, so to say, the normative order. So she uh, uh, wants to uh, uh, reinstate the French law as superior to uh, the European law, so to uh, uh, restore uh, the legal sovereignty of France in uh, various uh, aspects. So, um, to conclude with uh, her proposition, it's quite clear that uh, she plans to destruct uh, the European Union, even if it's uh, very gradual uh, in, its, uh, in our program. Uh, the, the main objective is quite clear. This is to uh, uh, obtain the destruction of treaties and the, the institutional dynamics of the European Union. So, the, the main, uh, so only a common aspects with my point is that there is no precise indication about the way uh, by which she can implement those uh, promises. Uh, on the second question on the impact, uh, maybe on the short term uh, of um, uh, their promises on the European Union, I'm not a forecaster. It's quite difficult to uh, uh, give some uh, elements on these uh, uh, on these points. But uh, uh, I think that um, I have just general observation here. Uh, if Macron is reelected, it uh, would reinforce initiatives taken by EU uh, institutions uh, uh, in the long, in the short term, uh, especially uh, in the context of the war in Ukraine, and uh, uh, the pre French presidency of the European Union will uh, could end normally, so to say. Uh, if uh, Le Pen is elected, so it would create uh, multiple uncertainties in Europe as well as in France, I think. So, uh, first on the war in Ukraine, on the Franco-German couple, on uh, on pending issues such as. Uh, uh, the European Green Deal, uh, which has been initiated by the Commission, uh, chaired by uh, Ursula von der Leyen. So uh, I think that uh, there are a lot of uh, uncertainties uh, over the last, uh, the next two weeks uh, during the campaigns, and uh, uh, it's quite clear that the attention with which the election is followed abroad gives an idea of uh, the questions and expectations which are related to uh, uh, these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. The British are, are not massively interested in the French election most of the time, but we're kind of obsessed with Marine Le Pen. Um, we have no equivalent of Marine Le Pen. We have Nigel Farage, um, who is, um, you know, the 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 is a self-professed engineer of Brexit in the UK, but um, he's seen as anti-European, uh, whereas um, Marine Le Pen, rightly, is is seen as as far right, you know, something bigger, badder. Um, her name has all these negative connotations in the UK. So every election, all the questions that I get when I talk to people about the French election, but is Marine Le Pen going to win? And um, this is the first election, actually, where I haven't been able to say really confidently. Um, because 
for the first time, as, as you rightly say, we can't rule out the possibility. Um, and so that is causing some consternation. And we're also very surprised and a bit confused by what's going on in the French party system, because the sort of left-right, you know, centrepiece of competition fighting over the centre ground, that is the norm for British politics in the same way that it used to be the norm in France. Um, and we just haven't had this equivalent of a, a strong emergence of the far right. Again, the closest that we got was with UKIP, the sort of the, the pro-Brexit party. And then once Brexit came along, they, they pretty much disappeared again. Um, and any attempts to form a centrist party have been laughable by the uh, complete and utter failure. Um, it just doesn't happen at all. We have the Conservatives and we have Labour Party and that's, you know, that is the political mainstream. So trying to understand how you could have a strong centrist candidate flanked by hard left and hard right, that is an object of real curiosity for Britain. In terms of what all of this would mean for Britain in terms of the outcome, um, I think our view on the outcome is quite similar to most of the French political mainstream. We don't like Macron, but we like Le Pen that much less. Mm -hmm. um, and this, you know, the reason why the British don't like Macron is because you know he, he, he talked about wanting to do it. Um, he's, he's kind of wanted to do that the same with the British. He, he wanted to make sure that Brexit wouldn't pay and that other countries wouldn't see what happened with Brexit and think, hey, that's a good idea, let's get in on that, on that one. So he's deliberately made it a bit difficult for us. He's deliberately bargained quite hard with us. And when the actual Brexit negotiations were going on, uh, Macron was usually bad cop. Um, and he was normally the one quite willing to, um, to, to, to make Britain feel bad. And it's not just that, I mean, we have, constant fights uh, over Calais, um, the border between uh, the UK and France, um, Britain's refusal to take more refugees and uh, trying to blame it on France, you blame it on Britain, and there's, there's constant conflict there. Um, so overall, France doesn't have a, sorry, UK doesn't have a great impression of Macron. But that much said, he is the establishment and he is continuity um, and he's not the far right so those are all big things playing in his favour um, and an additional game changer that put everything in a new perspective was the outbreak of the war in Ukraine um, because suddenly NATO has taken a much more prominent role in the public consciousness and Macron is, is pro-NATO and, and Le Pen is, is anti-NATO um, and whilst there might be something notionally appealing for a country that has just quit the European Union to have another major country in France become hostile to the European Union because then we're no longer the priors and the outsiders and instead this sort of big block that we sit now outside of would, would start to disintegrate and we'd all be on a more level playing field. Um, the problem with all of that is that Britain's Brexit strategy amongst many other things, revolved on trying to strengthen our relationship with the USA. Um, we still had a sort of Atlanticist, um, sort of pro-NATO, pro-international trade uh, perspective. Whereas um, Le Pen doesn't want to forge stronger alliances with the USA, her sympathies lie closer to Russia. And that tension has been massively exacerbated by the outbreak of the war in Ukraine now that Russia is public enemy number one. And so Le Pen would really uh, fragilize that alliance there um, and would create a new level of chaos at a time when things are already tense and uncertain. So I think despite the general antipathy towards Macron and the sense that he has made Brexit as hard as he possibly could, I think the general feeling is that having the pain in power wouldn't make Brexit easier for us. It would simply create further chaos and make the alliances that we are trying to forge post-Brexit that much weaker and harder to cement. I'm aware that we don't have a huge amount of time for questions and some of the other things I wanted to say have already been covered, so I'll let the people stop there. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much.